Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Kimmel, um, and uh, I'm here to welcome you all to this event. Uh, just to let you know, this is the third in a series uh, of, of salon events, uh, conversations that, um, that we, the Center for the Study of Men and Masculinities at Stony Brook, have been doing with Marianne Schnall, the Executive Director of Feminist.com. We've been partnering together to try to, put, to try to create some conversations about how women and men can be working together as allies in this, in this current era. Um, I just want to thank, before we begin, I just want to thank uh, uh, the, our friends and partners in this, in this event, Willis Shallot and, and Jim Heinen for, uh, and their staff, uh, also uh, Chris Desen, uh, and all, the whole staff of RTM who've really helped facilitate this entire event. So thank you very much. So, so I think many of us are here because we are, we are seeking, constantly seeking opportunities to be together. Uh, we need these conversations. We need to be together to have these kinds of conversations. Um, and I was, and in thinking about tonight, I was thinking about um, something that I used to do when I, when I was little. I used to pester my father and and grand and grandparents all the time, um, to, and I, I kept asking them, "What was it like?" My father served in the in the Second World War. Uh, my grandfather in the First World War, and um, and uh, lived through the Depression. So I kept asking them, like. What was it like to live through those times and not know how the story ended? Because as a baby boomer, I come to understand the Second World War already knowing we'd won, right? So I knew that. So that's my entire approach. I never experienced any anxiety about that. We won. But I kept trying to ask them, what did it feel like with not to know? Not to know how the story ends. So I was thinking about that uh, recently um, because we at, at a family dinner, my son who's now 18, I was thinking not about what I was going to say to him, but what his children will say to me. What was it like to live at the beginning of this time? In the first few weeks, didn't you see X or Y? Did anyone know this might happen, that might happen? We're living in a time where we don't know how this story is going to end. Um, at times we feel like we may be able to influence the direction, and sometimes we don't. And, I, and, we, and so I felt that this is a time when we need to have some conversations with each other. Now particularly the conversations that Marianne and I have, work, have been working on have been conversations about how men and women can work together. We live in a time of greater gender equality than ever before. Um, and we need to find places, ways, spaces where we can be working together. What are the areas? What are the issues? So we, we came up with this idea of having these conversations, women and men as allies, with the idea that we could take specific areas, specific issues, and work through what, 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 we, what we were calling conveniently an allies agenda. What would that look like? And we brought together tonight uh, a panel of amazing people who can address this from such different angles. So you have their bios in, in your program. So I, I don't think you need me to go through that, but let me at least introduce them to you. Um, by the way, that's Marianne Schnall on the other end. She will be my, my co MC. So to my immediate, immediate left is Alexis Grinnell. Uh, who is a political consultant and a, a, a opinion writer. You've probably seen things that she's written. Uh, I've seen things that she's written in Daily News, other places. Next to Alexis is Dan Gorodnik, a member of the New York City Council. Uh, you, yeah, you can applaud if you want. <laughs> um, uh, and, and, next to, uh, and next to Dan is Joe Gamble, um, who uh, is the national director of the network at the Roosevelt Institute. And finally, Jimmy Briggs, a uh, well-known journalist and activist and the founder uh, and originator of the Man Up campaign, which engaged uh, young people, uh, both boys and girls, young people from around the world to uh, develop local projects to, in, uh, to engage boys at, around violence against women worldwide. So, uh, so it's, it's an extraordinary group. 
And uh, I just want to say that what we're trying to do is create these events all through to, to help them create to create themselves. We want to cr continue to create these kinds of events. If you're inspired by the kind of conversations that we're trying to facilitate here, talk to us afterwards. We're, um, you can expect uh, uh, an email, uh, not many, at least, but one. At, we have we we have your addresses. We we know where you live online. Um, at, just to follow up to ask your you know for feedback about this and if you want to continue to to help us or work with us uh, as as we go forward. So with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to to Marianne to ask our to engage our panelists. Well, hello everybody, and let me also thank Michael and uh, the Center for the Study of Men and Masculinities. This uh, I've really been enjoying partnering with him um, on this series. So first, before we start addressing all of the many challenges and problems, and you know all of the sort of negatives that are going on, I want to start with just like one sort of positive note, which I still am feeling energized by the experience of being at the march in D.C., the Women's March. I don't know who was either at the D.C. march or at any march. Um, but that was so energizing and so hopeful to be with, I think they said it was over three million people that marched you know, across the country and around the world. And the hopeful things that I did notice were, one, that people right now that were never really engaged in issues are out there protesting, they're donating to organizations, they're using their voices, they're calling their representatives, so that to me is you know, a positive trend. Also, the fact that women led that effort, you know, led that, that movement and that march, and also that all of these coalitions are forming. I mean, we're talking here about allyship. To me, you know, the fact that you had all these people who were there, whether it was for women's rights or civil rights or racial justice, LGBT rights, immigrant rights, Muslim rights, environmental justice, all there, you know, around a common cause about equality and about freedom and about love, to me that's really hopeful. And I know, you know, for so long there's been talk about the need for intersectionality and feminism. Well, now it's going to have to be central to this movement in order for it to do the work that, you know, needs to be done. So I just wanted to start by saying that in terms of some hopeful things that I have noticed. And now getting to this you know, it seems to be there's this kind of literal daily barrage, this kind of cascading nightmare of edicts and orders and nominees that we all, you know, wake up to. So I wanted to start by asking the panel, um, what is sort of the one thing or, or one issue that sort of most concerns you um, that is happening right now? And, and you can balance that by also saying, what strategies do you see in terms of addressing those issues, or just you know what do you see that um, to counterbalance us all that does give you hope? So, um, whoever wants to answer that first, since Jimmy, uh, I can I can jump <laughs> in on that. Um, well, first of all, uh, there, there's just so many things. I mean, I don't want to look at my phone anymore. I mean, I feel like uh, the breaking news alerts and uh, the the things that you know are continually making me uh, angry and frustrated throughout the course of the day. Uh, I, uh, you know, I surely will not be able to, to uh, survive that uh, emotionally for four years. Um, maybe it'll be a shorter period, we don't, we'll see. Um, but the, the issue, and there, there's so many issues which as a result are on my mind. I, I spoke to a, a, a school group the other day and they were having a forum about respect. And it was kindergarten through fifth grade. And I was there to talk about, you know, how it's important for us to be respectful to one another. And the idea that the first and most prominent example that I could give to this group of students was the, at the time, the president-elect and the way that he treated people who he disagreed with, to me, was, uh, you know, it was, it was so obvious. Uh, it was controversial, obviously, to be giving that as the primary example, but I, I, you know, I actually think that you kind of have to call that out. Um, and there, there's endless numbers of policies, but the, the thing that really keeps me up at night is thinking about him up at night, uh, in the middle of the night, uh, in, in his bathrobe or not or whatever, uh, and you know, initiating either. Uh, conflicts through 140 characters or less, or 
positioning himself and this country in a way that we simply can't retreat from, and in one form or another, provoking military conflict that cannot simply be erased with an election. Most of these things can be uh, reversed with an election. Most, not all. Most of these things can be reversed with an election. Uh, a provocation of a military conflict cannot. That is the thing that I worry about the most. I think I'll do, I'll do the hopeful half of that question. Um, so one of the things that's really exciting is um, in these times of great national turmoil is federalism, right? States and municipalities can be fortresses against the onslaught of executive orders and what have you in the federal government, and we've already seen that be successful just this in the past week alone with the absurd Muslim ban. Um, and what's interesting, I think, about being New Yorkers is we are in a position where the federal government is just being, you know, has been taken hostage from us, basically. It's being held hostage from us. And we feel helpless, except we can do so much in state and local government which is something that's less sexy and typically ignored, but is where there's so much power and so much interest. I mean, I literally, you know, spent, before I came here, I was watching a live feed of the New York State Senate session, which is, um, you know, life. <laughs> right, very cool. Uh, but they actually did a bunch of things today that are hugely significant. And I pay attention to these things not only because um, this is my world, but because this is how power advances and states are pipelines. States are where uh, people like the Koch brothers and big national think tanks work in their laboratories to see what they're going to try to do on the national level. So there is so much interesting work we can do here. And this is a democratic state with shockingly outdated laws where we can actually advance change. So, you know, a big thing for me, for instance, this uh, session is going to be our 50-year-old uh, abortion law in New York State, which is actually completely out of sync with the federal law. So if my nightmare scenario, one of them, or, you know, in which Roe v. Wade is overturned happens, New York State is not prepared for that reality. Uh, and that used to be something that we took sort of for granted. We're like, oh, the Roe v. Wade, so it's OK that our laws are out of date. No, it's not. But we have this powerful moment to harness in which actually New Yorkers can get really serious about changing and revising the state law, which has, uh, doesn't have a sure chance of being revised. It really is going to re require the kind of energy we see going on at the national level directed locally. Yeah, I would agree that states and, and localities are a really important opportunity. It's where people can actually engage and actually meet their representatives and be heard and have influence. Um, and it speaks to part of what I'm concerned about, and then I'll also add an optimistic note. Um, and it's, it's the fragility, right, of our democratic institutions. And this moment really highlights just how fragile they were in the first place. I know a lot of us, you know, we saw the, the gutting of the Voting Rights Act by the Supreme Court. You know, we heard about lines at the polls. We heard about voter ID, things that we don't experience to the same degree, although there are still problems in the state of New York. Um, and we thought, okay, well, that's something that can just be fixed. But now, coming from particularly the presidential um, level, we're seeing this hyper-concentration of power with the executive and the delegitimizing of the U.S. Senate and the House of Representatives. And that, to me, is very, very scary. But it is a sign, I think, uh, for hope because so many people are so aware right now and so woke, to be frank, um, in a way that I thought I would never see for some time. It really woke us up out of our malaise because we always assumed, especially in my generation, that things would get better, right? That we were always going to see progress. But the reality is, is that progress has to be earned and fought for. I think a lot of people realize that and that creates an opportune moment for organizing. I'm going to... Uh differ to a certain degree from my colleagues on the panel. I think, I think for me, you know, I don't see what's happening now or what has happened at this point um, as a failure of democracy. I mean, I think the election, I think the processes that we're seeing right now from the executive orders and the, the challenges back and forth with the judiciary, I think it's democracy at work, actually. I mean, it may not have gone the way some of us wanted to go, but the system works. And, I, you know, for me, what keeps me up at night, maybe it's because I was a journalist in another life, I don't know, but. I think for me, what's really keeping me up and frustrating me is what I see as a general lack of moral courage. And not just from the people who voted for this presidential administration, but from all sides, really, because I, I keep searching for and hoping for uh, voices of moral courage to say, it can't be us versus them. Voices of moral courage to say, I'm not going to buy into the system dichotomy. 
I'm not gonna mimic what this party did so we can win next time. I'm looking for those voices, for those segments of our society that say, we're one country, you may have voted a different way, but I'm not gonna otherwise you because you voted that way. You know, I come from, I'm not a native New Yorker, I'm from Missouri. I had an interesting conversation with a friend of mine, also from Missouri, who is in Paris now. Uh, like me, he's African American, we grew up together. And we were talking about, you know, sharing our responses to the, to the election and where do we go from here. And it was interesting because, you know, I realized, you know, it's, 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 it's been very challenging for me since the last November uh, to talk about the process and to really respond um, to what I'm feeling at night, especially in the morning when I wake up, because, you know, the people that so many of us, you know, consider them are the people I grew up with in Missouri, or the people I went to college with in Georgia, or the people I spent time with as a journalist after Katrina on the Gulf Coast. And to me, they're not them. You know, they're, they're fellow Americans, sister and fellow Americans. So my, my hope is my hope and is my prayer at night is that, you know, in time we will find those compasses of moral courage, much like what we saw in the 50s and 60s when people could actually communicate and engage in a way that wasn't vilifying, that wasn't otherizing. And I, I think, you know, my, my sense of hope in this third question, Marianne, is that I, I do see, here and there, I see, I see moments or examples of people who are willing to say, I disagree with you, um, I, I'm against what, what you voted for, but let's have a conversation. I want to understand how you got to that place because until we, until we can get to that point, mm -hmm. this is a cycle. You know, in four, four years or eight years, it'll be someone else down south or in the Midwest saying, you know, I'm so angry, I'm so upset, them, us versus them. And to me, I don't see where that takes us but destruction. That is the end of democracy, in my opinion. Thanks for the applause. I didn't expect any, so thank you. Um, all right, well, I'm going to address a question to Alexis um, because uh, you, in terms of representing um, the media, um, the media has been cast in, as the, quote, you know, opposition party. I don't know if anybody's heard that it came out of Donald Trump's mouth. Um, so I'm curious, what type of special responsibility do you think that the media is going to play during this administration? What, what is their role going to be? And then also, as sort of a, a follow-up question, do, what insight do you have on how can the media cover gender issues more accurately and better in ways that so, don't sort of polarize gender issues as always sort of like he versus she? Sure. So just to be really clear, since I'm representing the media on this panel, um, <laughs> I'm an opinion writer. So this is different than a uh, news journalist. I write uh, mostly about gender and power, and it is opinion, often reported, re amplified by reporting and driven by analysis, but it is opinion journalism. That said, Jay Rosen, who's a media professor at NYU, has a wonderful theory called um, of what he calls the view from nowhere, which is this kind of uh, parochial idea that has sort of was has been baked into legacy media institutions that the ideal reporter is somebody who has no opinions and and no ideas and no perspective and simply is sort of like a recorder, somebody who writes down what happened and presents it quote unquote objectively. What Professor Rosen describes is this problem we've all read a lot about, which is uh, this results in false balance, so false equivalency, where you have Hillary Clinton um, had a secret server and Donald Trump's tax returns are a mystery. Same, same idea, because you know, here are all the facts. Here's what happened today. This is obviously absurd, and I think we've <laughs> reached the height of like media absurdity in this last cycle in particular, where, I mean, a man with a Twitter feed just like, broke all the rules and we the media was not prepared or equipped to address it because they were playing by a different set of rules. These rules that they had to be sort of view from nowhere objective and that their job was to report the facts. Well, what happens if somebody doesn't care about the facts? Uh, and that's why when the New York Times finally used the, the word liar or said, used the word lie on the front page, it was so, it was a huge deal because it was really breaking with tradition. Now I'm heartened to see the fact that I mean, it's just becoming much more routine in mainstream outlets where, you know, CNN will say, like, President Trump said this, no, f like, absolutely unsubstantiated, like, quite the opposite, totally false. <laughs> this is good. This is really important. Um, so I actually see the media really stepping up, and that's great. 
Um, and much to, I'm sure everyone saw Melissa McCarthy's hilarious yeah. portrayal of Sean Spicer on Saturday Live this weekend. Um, they are routinely making a mockery of him, except he's really making a mockery of himself. Um, in some ways, I think the, the media's job here is to, to like let the stupidity play out while, while not being afraid to call it stupid. And, I, and I, I see that voice coming forward. To your second point, so something really interesting about the way gender gets covered, because I write about gender and think about gender a lot, um, I often notice what's not said. And when I was thinking about this question in anticipation of this event, I kind of went through examples of sort of mainstream publications where gender was sort of slowly getting, getting woven in in interesting ways. Um, and one great example I'm going to use, just because I think it really gets to this subtlety that we don't see enough of, uh, Willie Newman had a story in the New York Times last week about Paul Massey, who's a Republican running for New York City mayor. And in this piece about Mr. Massey, he writes that, you know, Paul Massey has some statement where he's like, I believe in, um, you know, equality for women on every level. And then later on, a few graphs down, he talks about the fact that all his, he just, it's a, it's a throwaway line, you could have missed it, but he says, you know, all of Mr. Massey's advisors are men. It was not, it, it, but it, it was really subtle. It was several graphs after this piece of information and it was thrown in there to say, it, it was actually thrown in there in connection with a, you know, a, a point about how he you know, has several well-paid advisors, that's where he spent all his money. Incidentally, all of them were men. Very much a kind of throwaway fact, but that's told you everything. And that's the kind of information that I think is really relevant for news reporters to include more of the time. So if you're sitting there opposite, if we all, you know, if you watch the Super Bowl, you saw this Audi commercial, right? Gender equality, pay, pay equity, blah, blah, blah. Well, Jeff um, Judd Legume, who's the executive editor of thinkprogress.org, tweeted a photo of Audi's board, all white men. <laughs> you know, so the, I, that kind of fact checking so here's the story, but here's what they're not telling you, I think is really um, the w a way in which media can do a better job covering this stuff because most of the time they're noticing it internally and it doesn't make it into the story. But I actually wrote Willie a note after that uh, his story ran. I said, thank you so much for including this. I caught that. It's great. He was like, thank you for noticing. I had to fight for that. <laughs> but he won. And I think the, when he, he stood up to his editors who were, he, you know, who were, who were cutting for space, right? Print journalists are subject to space constraints. And so an editor is deciding what's really vital information. Well, Willie bothered to say, I actually think it's really vital that this guy is talking about equality for women, but he's surrounded by men. Let's, let's not write a standalone story about that, but let's include that in the story. So that's an example, I think, of how reporters can do a good job. I was, I was thinking as you were talking a lot, just that, um, that, that some of the humor that we've all probably felt that we needed so desperately to sort of balance the daily outrage. Um, Andy Borowitz had this wonderful little column about how uh, Trump has already created so many jobs for fact checkers. Um, uh, and um, so, uh, and, and so he said there were you know several mil several uh, million three million and Sean Spicer said no three billion. Um, <laughs> so but I want to I want to follow up with a question for Dan about something that you said earlier about the capacity of local and state government to respond to larger national policies in some ways to throw up some barriers to them, in other ways to do end runs around them, in other words, to, to maintain the kind of new federalism uh, where you know, those of us who are progressive are looking for, you know, for the, for the sort of parcelization. You know, it's, it's weird for me as a New Yorker to be saying, states' rights, you know, that's a good idea. You know, this is not where I started. Right. So, so, so I want to ask Dan, like thinking about the kinds of things that are on offer right now uh, in the in in the in the city. For example, um, because the United States is is one of only two nations in the world that has not ratified the CEDAW uh, Convention from the UN. The other country is Somalia. Um, we have not ratified that, but cities around the country are now coming to ratify it. So D.C., <coughs> San Francisco, other cities are now, and there's going to be a proposal at the city council that the city of New York should ratify CEDAW. Are these the kinds of things that you're you're looking to the city council, the city to be sort of promoting as a as a way to sort of do an all, a, a kind of 
parallel set of policies even? The answer is definitely yes. Um, we have a few tools at our disposal locally. One of them is what you just described, which is uh, essentially speech. Uh, it's our ability to uh, communicate uh, our position locally on various issues, whether it's CEDAW or, you know, Steve Bannon being appointed to the Security Council or uh, the, you know, the, the ban on refugees uh, or a any, anything. Um, so we certainly have the ability to do that and I would expect that you will likely hear organized communication from the local government of New York City about our views on these various issues. Uh, we also have the tools of uh, going to court as necessary. I mean, the city of San Francisco uh, just uh, went to court on the subject of uh, the Sanctuary Cities Executive Order. Um, and uh, there are other orders, including that one, which could be relevant to New York City to use uh, its powers and its standing to be able to bring a court case. Um, we have the ability to spend money. Uh, to defend people who find themselves on the receiving end of federal scrutiny, attack, challenge, etc. Uh, so if they're going to be looking to go after, uh, go after undocumented people and find ways to deport them, we can spend more money to defend the rights of undocumented people who may have actual rights uh, to be here. Um, then the most obvious is the existence of programs like sanctuary cities to begin with, uh, where uh, you know New York City is far from exclusive in being a city that will not allow our police department to act as uh, an adjunct of the federal immigration enforcement arm. Uh, and uh, we do that deliberately. We believe that New York's police officers should not be in that role, and that frankly, if they were in that role, it would make New York a much less safe place. Uh, so these are the sorts of policies that we can enact, the sorts of expressions that we can make, the sorts of uh, allocation of funds that we can make to be able to protect local interests. And Alexis's point about you know um, passing into law protections on choice uh, is, a, is a great example. That's one which would be in, in the state of New York, not in the city. Uh, but yes, yes, we have to do this stuff uh, because um, everything it feels like is up for grabs at this point. Uh, states' rights would not be the place where we would uh, originate uh, as a general policy matter, but as it turns out, states and cities do have some rights here and we will be exercising them. Now, Joelle, I have two questions for you. Um, you know, young people are our future. You're 26. Um, you work with a lot of people under 35 who have borne, you know, the economic crisis and rising education costs and diminishing, you know, civil and human rights. Um, how are they reacting, sort of, to, to the current political, you know, climate that we're in? And how can we kind of rebuild the social contract for the next generation? Yes, I do work with a lot of young people, um, college students, young professionals all across the country, um, 40 different states at this point. And it's been an interesting period um, because a lot of folks um, grew up, like you said, um, dealing with like a brunt of the brunt of the recession, a feeling of rolling back of their rights, and now they're faced with this election. And to be honest, I was surprised by how much energy there was in the communities that we work with. Um, after the election, because my assumption would be that they would be demoralized, that, you know, you look at the charts and how generations voted, and the only generation that did not vote for Trump was uh, 18 to 35, right? And so this is definitely a group that is not seeing their voices represented, despite being the same portion of the electorate as the boomer generation, about 36%. Right, and so I was really concerned as, as to how people would be reacting, but the reality is that there's actually, um, I think a lot of people decided to dig in and fight. Um, they, they took to the streets. I saw all over my social media, people at the Women's March, people at marches uh, protesting the executive order, the Muslim ban. 
um, folks are really taking to uh, this movement because I think it now feels like there's actually an opportunity to really shape their political future. So we did a poll of about a thousand young people right before the election asking them the top issues. They cared about education, they cared about economic justice issues, they cared about what we called human rights issues instead of civil rights issues because I think we're clearly not just talking about civil rights, we're talking about people's rights to exist and, and live, right? But above all of that, they were demoralized by the political system. And you saw that play out in the election with how young people were voting. They did not believe that the democratic process was democratic. And this is actually a moment in which people feel like they have the potential to shape the system again. It's gonna be a lot of work, but I actually think that that's a really unique thing for folks who are interested in going back to their communities and organizing, um, because that's something that people didn't feel like they had an opportunity to do before. They felt like the system was shaped how it was, it works how, how it always works out. The candidate who is picked by the establishment wins. And that's, I think, it's collateral, unfortunately, but I think it's actually a point of, of opportunity. And building on that, um, you know, the Roosevelt Network is full of sort of young women leaders who are committed to enacting policy change locally and pursuing careers in public service. Um, what advice or insights do you have on how, you know, this is actually one of the positive trends we have seen is since the election, there's been a surge in um, the amount of women that are signing up for programs that uh, train women to, to run for office. So how can we engage and support more young women in terms of getting them into, the, into political leadership? Yeah, that was really, need them. <laughs> it was a really exciting moment and we're starting to see people step up. Actually, a young woman I went, I used to work with um, back in my home state of California um, won her race in the Arizona State House. So that was a, an exciting moment to see uh, someone actually make it cross the finish line. And I do think running for office is really important, of course. Um, and we should be encouraging women to run, to build the social and political capital that you need to win a race. But I also think this is a moment where we can take a step back and think about what are our actual goals in fighting for gender justice? Is it representation? Or is it cultural, political change that uplifts everyone? Because I do think that a trap we fall into is that if we can just get one more person in the boardroom, if we can just get one more person in office, they're just gonna carry the rest of us, right? And so we have to start to think a little bit more expansively about how people can be involved. Um, and that's possible, right? Even looking back at the Women's March and the, the platform that they released, if, I don't know if you had a chance to read it, but it was incredibly progressive, it was intersectional, and it thought beyond that paradigm of like one leader. And I think that that kind of thinking is gonna get us to see a lot more justice work done and also is an important entry point for folks who do not identify as female, right? Because you're not just thinking, how do I get one person into office and they can carry the platform for the rest of the people who identify the same way as them. Instead, you're thinking about how do I change society so that I ba rebalance, or actually balance in the first place, the, the power between folks who identify as male and folks who do not, right? And I think that that's really at the heart of, of this issue for me. I have, I have a question for, for you, Jimmy, um, uh, and it's really a question raised by your earlier comment um, when you were saying that, you know, being from Missouri, these people are your neighbors, they're people you knew, the people you grew up with, uh, people you knew in Georgia. Um, I, I wondered if you could talk a little bit uh, about the kind of pro the pro program that you are developing uh, in Ferguson. Um, because I think it's a, it's a hopeful method of what uh, I think you call it participatory journalism. And I think it's a way for us to begin to hear the voices of those that we have been tuning out. Uh, uh, tuning out. Um, you know, when I did Angry White Men some years ago, um, you know, that, that was a book that came out in 2013. The name Trump is not in the book anywhere. Um, you know, it, I wrote a book about his followers, right? They were just wait, they were waiting for the leader to show up. I feel like, I, I felt like I went out deliberately to hear voices that I had not wanted to listen to. Um, didn't like what I heard a lot of the time. But I thought it was important to do that. So, I, and I think that that's a really hopeful method for people here to, to begin to think about how we humanize the other, especially in a moment when we believe that we as the other are being dehumanized. Well, thank you, thank you, Michael. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, just to clarify, I am from Missouri. I grew up there. 
I have spent over the majority of my life in New York for several decades, so I feel this dichotomy in terms of identity. But a year ago, I started going back between New York and Ferguson when we got up every month you know, to Ferguson. Um, I spent part of my childhood there. My mom taught, she was a school teacher. She, she taught in that school district. My grandmother lived there until she passed away. Like Ferguson, well before anyone had even heard of it, or Michael Brown, was, was the place I just knew from growing up. I identified with Ferguson. And you know, this project came out of several motivations. One, the narrative of Ferguson as a community, of who lived there, or the dynamics I felt um, as it was covered by my former colleagues in journalism, I felt it wasn't a, a full holistic narrative. It wasn't three-dimensional. Uh, it was a character of a place that I, I knew intimately. More, it seemed came across more of a Selma 65 or Mississippi 64 or Birmingham 63 than that place I knew intimately. And so I wanted to, you know, kind of for myself rediscover Ferguson. And in doing so, one of the one of the quotes I, you know, quotes and I guess um, encouragements, if you will. I had a quote from Sabrina Fulton, who was Trayvon's mother. And it's, a, it's something she said to Leslie McSpadden, Michael Brown's mother, in the midst of the unrest in Ferguson. And she said, um, she didn't say it to her directly, but she said, kind of put it out in the world and said, if, if they can't hear us, we have to make them feel us. And with this project, you know, this whole history project, having been a journalist for 20 years of my life, uh, here internationally, I felt like, I just took that to heart when I heard her say that. You know, like, I just felt like people were talking past each other, or, or otherizing each other. And so I started going to Ferguson, you know, kind of reintegrating myself into the community and really just, you know, asking people to share their oral histories, their, their life narratives mm -hmm. as part of this larger project. For one, to tell the, the, the more authentic narrative of this community, putting the voices and the, the power of the storytelling back in place that people live there, but also trying to understand, you know, what, what really happened after 20, August 2014 and what was the narrative since then? And what, the funny thing happened because I started interviewing people, cops, uh, Black Lives Matter activists, uh, the Brown, Brown family, stakeholders, business owners, residents, young activists, older white residents, or younger black residents about not just what happened in August 2014, but what happened before then as well. And then I started training people who live there to interview each other because I just felt like if people could, could share and tell their stories, maybe this is what we're finding common ground, common humanity. And for me, you know, working on this project, actually going back to Ferguson a couple of weeks for two weeks to spend time in that community, um, it just really shown me even before the election, especially since the election, I've been there once since the election, last November, um, the power of, of, of story sharing and telling, but also, I guess, the, you know, the, the common human, threat of humanity that we all possess in this country. I mean, someone, I was in India for the month of December with my wife, and you know, a number of people said to me, ask, were asking me about what life is like in the States, or as a colored man, in their terms, as a colored man, how I felt, you know, since Trump's election. I said, I felt the way I did before he was elected, actually. You know, I'm a middle-aged black man, luckily middle-aged black man in America. I grew up in Missouri. For me, I, I feel the same way I did before he was elected, you know? And I said, you know, I think what's gonna save this country is really kind of rediscovering, highlighting the common humanity. I think in this space, when we talk about the theme of this, this panel, women and men as allies, I think it also comes down to dialogue and, and that common ground, common humanity, because, you know, we've talked a lot about the march on Washington here in New York as well, and around the country, around the world. But I think what's something that has to happen is that critical dialogue within this burgeoning movement to, to understand where are the connections. I mean, I don't want to presume that the climate change community has the exact same goals as Black Lives Matter. I, I don't know that. Right. I don't want to assume Black Lives Matter has the same exact goals as the gender, gender equality and justice space. I don't know that. I think we, we won't know that until we have critical, sometimes awkward, sometimes painful dialogue with each other to find out where do we intersect? Where do our methods intersect? Maybe they, they support, you know, this, this, this platform supports uh, sex work, and this one's, like, this one's abolitionist. How do we know that unless we have a conversation? Um, well, I, I want to sort of pose the question, but also sort of answer it before I pose it to the rest of you. Um, because I think that what I'd like us to do is turn the conversation more, more directly to the question of women and men's conversation with each other. How we can work together, how we can find, find those kinds of causes, those kinds of issues. Um, one of the things that has struck me, I think it's the easy, you know, one of the easy gender analysis 
that I have that everybody here knows shares it. It's pretty easy to, to see. You know, you look at all of the appointments, you look at the misogyny and sexism in the language, in the policies, um, in the in the composition of a cabinet. Um, so we see the 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 misogyny, the anti the anti woman position. But I think we also have to look at the policies. We are witnessing the beginning of the greatest masculinization of public policy we've ever seen. I mean, what does Trump mean when he says we have to bring back those jobs? He's talking about jobs in heavy industry, manufacturing, extractive industries, coal. Um, who, who, who were the people who held those jobs? This is the, and, and what are the jobs that are going to be cut? Service sector. This is the greatest shift in, or the proposition is the greatest masculinization of our economic policy that we've witnessed in our lifetime. Um, and it, I mean, it, it makes the idea of those shovel-ready jobs that we're going to solve the, the economic crisis pale in comparison. So for me, it's both the question of the, co the gendered composition of these uh, of these groups. It's more than the simple anti-woman posture. It's also understanding that the policies themselves are gendered. And that seems to me to be a place where I think we can, we, 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 that's, that's a place where we can begin to have those kind of conversations. Um, one other thought that I had, and this is a question for all of you, but I, I, I want to sort of riff off of, uh, Jimmy's comments. Um, one of the other places where you've been most visible as an activist has been engaging men around violence against women. Right? There's a place where men have a, have a place, can step up, can act. How does that look to you <coughs> now? Um, and, uh, and then I'll ask the rest of the panel to sort of think about what's one area where you see women and men being able to, to act together in this historical moment? I think, thank you for the question, Michael. I think there's a lot of activity emerging, vibrance, burgeoning, well before, but especially since the election last November. I mean, I, I have so much hope, you know, not just in this city, but nationally, that there are young men, and boys even, who recognize the, the, the impact of the tenor of this presidential administration on how women's, women's lives will be, be affected, particularly when it comes to personal physical safety. I mean, I'm just looking at the audience here. I see my brother Louis Tapia, Black Boy Rise, Mohammed Naeem, who's, who's a Queens activist, Afghan American. I mean. Those two and so other young men, I'm sure, in the audience, you know, along with thousands of other young men across the country, are doing the critical work necessary to, you know, to engage young men in their communities, to engage them in places where they authentically gather, congregate in the language they will resonate with them. I think, <clears throat> I think that we have to support, affirm, and encourage their efforts, but also the efforts that are being done slowly, slowly um, with younger children. I think we have to. We talked about this before, Michael. I think it's now more than ever. I think someone was talking about how before how you know the, you know younger children are asking questions about this person in the White House who's saying these things and mm -hmm. you know, what's the impact on us. I think we have to have these conversations we've been avoiding for too long with our kids, with our yeah. small kids, elementary school. We have to have a conversation about what's happening in the White House and the, what's happening nationally in terms of the conversation. But we also have to talk to our young women, girls and boys, and young men um, as early as possible to educate them about what they're hearing, what they're seeing, and why. <coughs> You know, such behavior, such language is not only detrimental to them, but also to our collective collective selves. So, what's one what's one area? Um, I, I'll tell you mine first. See what you can think about. What, what, um, so, I mean, I mean, one of the only ways I've felt like I can stay sane in this uh, in, 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 is to focus on one thing, because I felt like I was becoming so scattered and thinking about so many other things. So, here's a place that I was thinking. I, I did a piece in, in Time Magazine. Uh, a couple weeks ago about this. I, I thought like, if Roe v. Wade disappears, mm -hmm. where are the men in this conversation? Where, you know, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. We've, we have, for years, we have thought that women's reproductive rights is really all about women. And we men need to come, we, we men need to step up at this point, and we need to say, wait a minute. I need women's reproductive rights. It benefits me. It benefits me because we just met at a party and we were, you know, I didn't even know if I, we were dating. Or because we already had three kids and we couldn't afford another one. Or because we were planning on, you know, 
balancing our work and family and this wasn't the right time for us, or hundreds of other reasons why men benefit from women's reproductive uh, freedom. So it seems to me that this is a place where we men can clearly be working with women. We have been so quiet about this. Where are the, you know, I, I feel like there should be an organization, we'll start it right now, Men for Choice. You got it. Right? We have got to, this is a place where we know we have to step up because we can't leave women out there alone on, the, uh, on, the, on this front. So, uh, I'd love to talk about this, actually. <laughs> this is going to make my mother so happy. Because <laughs> uh, it's basically what she talks about all the time to me. Um, but this whole constructive, this narrative of like women's issues is absurd yeah. to begin with. And that's exactly where we get this kind of binary between like, oh, abortion is a woman's issue. And so we see like women showing up to rallies about abortion, as, but like women don't get pregnant by themselves. So it's really confusing why that would just be like a woman's issue. Um, and you know, actually something Joelle said earlier made me think of this as well, the idea of getting more women into office. Well, you know, so much of the time I see, go to these like various workshops and whatever, and I, you know, fundraisers, it's all women trying to get women into office. Yeah. We're not actually engaging men and why that's a good thing for men. One of my, I'm, I'm wearing the exact same outfit I wore at the Women's March, and I saw a guy wearing this sweatshirt, which I just loved. And I also love that easily, I thought, a third or more of the Women's March. People it I says saw the future is female. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I saw, I thought at least a third of the, the marchers at, in DC were men, easily, and that was so encouraging. But I actually think abortion is a great example. Um, we do not s have a conversation about why abortion is important for men. We don't have a conversation about um, really why equal pay is important to men. We've created a category of women's issues, which are niche, but we actually know from all this research and all this data that you want gender balance, be it on a piece of legislation, because that actually indicates whether or not the legislation, the probability of whether or not it'll pass, but also it affects the policy making process so that the um, masculinization of policy also has to do with the way in which that policy is developed. So there's empirical data that show that when more women are part of that process, you get different outcomes. We see this even in economic analyses of companies that don't have gender balance on, in uh, their leadership or management. It's actually results in like worse economic outcomes for that company. It's not as profitable. Gender balance is important for so many um, reasons that we can use empirical indicators to point to. But I think this larger question for me has to do with also, um, I'm very focused on this male inclusion. How do we give men the tools to engage? So. Uh, you know, whether it's somebody using, you know, locker room talk. I mean, locker room talk happens between men, right? So what do you do if you're a guy and you're not into that? Right. I think empowering, um, providing the kind of language and script about what do you say and this really goes to Michael's incredible work about how masculinity is performed and proven constantly. How do we reconfigure masculinity? Because that to me is, you know, this administration is like really horrible for women, but it's also really horrible for men. That's right. That's and right. I, I'm very concerned with articulating how that's true and where men really are potentially the biggest losers. Yeah. Dan and I have been on several panels where we've talked about uh, about parental leave in exactly these terms. I, that was the example that I was going to give, and not surprisingly. Um, uh, first of all, I'm in on Men for Choice. Count me in. We've got okay. two members so Good. far. All right. Uh, <laughs> and. Um, you know, and, and, and to Alexis's point, you know, these issues are really uh, cross over in so many ways. And I have now been uh, on the city council here in New York for 11 years and one month. And I can, you know, share with you the experience of there being rallies for various issues which were, you know, perceived to be women's issues to which I was just not invited. Uh, and would have attended if I actually knew they were happening. So I think that there, there are opportunities that are sometimes uh, being lost here uh, to engage male allies who are, who are ready to, uh, to jump in and, and support. Um, but the, the, the point about uh, parental leave, I mean, I think this is a, this is a biggie uh, because what uh, Donald Trump has proposed, or he proposed it in the middle of the campaign, I haven't heard anything about it you know, since, um, was six weeks of maternity leave, maternity leave, um, 
which of course is you know such a it's a it's a flawed premise that this is the the mother's uh, primary obligation here and that the father is an afterthought uh, or not important to the equation um, and you know I am I am a father of two young boys age six and three um, and you know took um, family leave when each was born uh, found that to be one of the most um, you know important times of my life only the only second to that is every other day since uh, which has been you know it just gotten better and better as you know as a, a part of this you know this family with these boys getting uh, older and greater every day um, but for a family uh, it's critically important, I think, to make sure that you have the opportunity for both parents to be able to take time and to do that, and for there not to be stigma in the job uh, when the dads are actually taking uh, family leave, and for there to be some balance for the moms who work, who uh, you know are not bearing all of the burden, uh, and when you're dealing with family leave, it's not just about taking care of little kids it could be taking care of a sick relative and everybody has had a sick relative at one point or another so finding ways to make that conversation more real yeah. more legitimate uh, serves to the benefit of women to men to the economy to our jobs um, and so I think that is that's one issue uh, that I would flag I would only add, I think there's an opportunity. I think I, I've been starting to hear it in, as I listen to you all talk and in, in engaging men in this conversation around um, what a good job is gonna be in the future. Um, you mentioned you know, Trump talking a lot about bringing jobs back that were taken away by Mexico and China and they're not coming back, um, even if he tries to make them or you know, lifts up all these trade barriers that you know, just raise, raise the price of goods and all that stuff. And I get wonky, so you can stop me if I do that. Um, but the reality is, like, we're in a point at which a lot of folks who were used to having jobs that they felt were valuable and were valued by society are no longer there. There's a crisis of, of work and dignity. And frankly, for a lot of women, that's been our whole lives, right? And so I think there's really an opportunity there, though, to talk about, like, what kind of jobs do we want? What kind of jobs do we value if the jobs that traditionally were valued by our society are no longer there? Um, you heard this during the lecture a little bit, talking about green jobs, talking about those kinds of jobs. But we've also seen strides made by state and local governments to actually um, provide labor protections for people who do do domestic work, right? who do do the kinds of jobs that were traditionally not valued. And so I think that that's an opportunity for folks across the gender spectrum to like engage in a conversation. Because at the end of the day, you know, economic security is going to be a huge issue in this country and is going to be raised again and again by the administration. And if we're thinking smartly about this, you know, we can really use it to bring in um, men into a conversation um, led by women that could produce more equitable outcomes. Well, I think the one thing before I say my general question, that I just want to add to that is, first of all, I want to definitely agree with what Alexis said regarding um, reframing. You know, these are not women issues; these are human issues, and that the idea of having more women in leadership is not, you know, a women's issue. It's a matter of diversity. It's a matter of a reflective democracy. So I think, you know, we all benefit from that. And then I just everything that I'm hearing. I mean, I think that there is something, even what you were saying about, you know, having. Um, leave you know for men we have to change also the the culture of how we raise boys and men in the first place because you know boys are not raised to think that's manly to do and I think that there's there's a lot of you know sort of you know we have to start to look at how destructive gender stereotypes not just negatively impact women and girls but they negatively impact men and boys and if we don't start to do that, I mean, I think we are seeing the worst example of how toxic masculinity can play out in President Trump. Like, I can't even think of anybody who, you know, sort of exemplifies that more. So maybe that's like a teachable moment, or I would, I mean, I would hope so. 
Um, so I think that that's somewhere, but I also think that women have to, it's sort of like what you were saying, have to invite men into these conversations, because often, you know, we, we don't do that, or maybe women don't invite men to the mommy and me group, or, you know, make men feel um, unmanly if they decide to stay home with their children. So I think there's a, a larger conversation there. So that was one of the things that um, I would add in terms of uh, ways that men and women can work together. Um, so just sort of bridging to this, you know, last question, which, and then we'll open up to the audience. Um, you know, we've, we've discussed a lot here today that um, sounds very uh, discouraging, can be a little depressing. There's obviously a lot that we're facing right now. Um, but hopefully we've gotten some sort of strength and, and, you know, feeling of solidarity from us all being together and the collective power that we have. Um, in working together. So I guess one of the things that I'm hoping that the, the panel can all share is, you know, what are some concrete actions we can all take, um, whether it's tonight, tomorrow morning, you know, moving forward, um, you know, as we go on this long journey. And, and actually, I've heard it said that this isn't going to be a sprint, it's going to be a marathon. So as we're doing all this, and believe me, this is advice I could use too, how do we keep our energy up? And how do we remember to take care of ourselves and actually enjoy life while we're sort of facing, you know, as, as Michael says, whatever we're facing, um, you know, uh, you know, to manage to keep us so ourselves positive while doing the work we need to do. Okay, I'm a big talker, so I will just keep going if no one cuts me off. <laughs> um, oh, I'm sitting right next to you. <laughs> um, so. You know, this this is something we were talking about a little earlier, but um, I kind of reject this concept of allies. Um, I actually really think it's um, it's it's goes to the larger point about how I think I to address your question. We need to be thinking. An ally to me is somebody who supports my fight, as opposed to someone who's a partner on the battlefield together. For instance, it would be weird if I said, you know, I'm an ally to men. Right? It's clearly not how the language is construed. The power dynamic doesn't work that way. That makes no sense. Mm -hmm. But I was raised in a two-feminist household, and I would never have thought of my father as my mother's ally. If anything, he was the angrier feminist in the house. <laughs> so um, I think that that total reconfiguration of masculinity mm -hmm. is um, really where, I, for me, where my agenda is. And my concern which has always really been for the way in which women lose out in this discussion, has, is for myself balancing against how I'm now very worried about boys and men and want to really focus my attention there. Um, to, into how, how to bring men into that space, but also how to reach men who don't know they, that they want to be in that space and are maybe struggling and suffering under a patriarchy that is harming them. And when they are harmed, um, I am harmed as well. And so are women and girls. Um, and also to the self-care point, this is so hugely important because you know we're now all building in more and more time to be protesting, to be calling our representatives, to be actively working on issues. I mean, you just can't do that 24/7 and like be a normal, happy person. Like you have got to watch The Big Lebowski a lot, which is one of my coping mechanisms personally. Which also contains a great line: "Shut the fuck up, Donnie," which works really in this political moment. Hearing John Goodman say that over and over again makes me. So happy. So I, I think it's important to have like your go-to happy place, and you know, be with people and in community with people to also share how you're, you know, coping, and also just be able to have fun too. That has to be built in. Otherwise, you burn out. So uh, I would, I, I absolutely agree with that. Um, and I think that one of the risks that we have right now is that there's a high level of energy and engagement and in some cases not necessarily a lot of focus. Um, and so, you know, I, I, you know I, I tweeted the other day that all of New York City is sick right now because, you know, we've all been standing out in the cold at the rallies <laughs> against the Trump policies and everybody's, you know, gotten sick in the process. Um, but what we, we really need to, to do is make sure that our energies are focused uh, that we're not all trying to reinvent the wheel and reinvent the ways to organize and to push back. There are great organizations out there that do this all the time. Uh, find them, affiliate with them, read their 
emails and their calls to action when they come participate. Don't try to reinvent the wheel. That would be one thing I would say. Um, the other thing I would say is go home, find the switchboard for Congress, get a big Sharpie, put it on your refrigerator on a piece of paper, and when you see something in the newspaper in the morning or see something on television that is just wrong, just pick up the phone and call either your local representative or any representative for whom you have any marginal connection for whatever reason at all. Uh, light up those switchboards. It clearly is having an impact. Uh, when the House of Representatives was considering gutting the ethics rules and people called in in a seemingly not really uh, fully organized way, they went, went scurrying and dropped it. Uh, this is this is relevant, and for people who don't necessarily call governmental offices all the time, it does not need to be perfectly formatted. You don't need to be perfectly articulate in your thoughts. Just pick up the phone and express whatever it is. I'm on the receiving of these end of these calls all the time. I can tell you that we pay attention when there is any level of. Uh, either cohesion or consistency in the message. If it feels manufactured, we may discount it. But when we hear from people and it feels like people are actually angry about something, whether I did it or it's something that's out there that's pending or it's something that they want to either support or give me strength to, to fight back against, we pay attention. And it's clear that Congress pays attention to, uh, to it too. So I would go get that Sharpie, put it on your refrigerator, and call liberally. In, in all, in all meanings of the word. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, I would say two things. Um, the first thing is to find one place to lead and one place to follow. So every single person who's getting active right now, you know, has a unique value add. Figure out what yours is and figure out how you can lead there. But I also say find a place to follow. To your point, there are a lot of great organizations, great efforts going on, and. And the biggest mistake we could make is that everyone wants to be a leader and no one's following and then nothing <laughs> happens. So figure out where you're not an expert, where you feel like you don't know exactly what's going on but you know it's important and, and follow. Um, and then the second thing I would say is to just become bigger than yourself. Um, one of the other dangers that we risk falling into when we are in one of these <coughs> kinds of moments is that um, everyone you know, thinks all these great things in their head, they have all these opinions, they maybe like post a Facebook status too many times a day, um, but we never actually reach out to and, and organize the people that we know. There were so many of my friends who said, my aunt, my grandmother, my cousin, they didn't vote or they didn't vote for who I wanted them to vote for, and I was like, but you know them and you think all these great things and they trust you. And more than any professional organizer, you're going to be the best conduit for them actually getting organized and fighting for a values aligned you know, government that they wanna see. And so take that moment to you know, hit up that person who is either saying nothing or is kind of getting on your nerves um, with how they're, they're seeing things going on in, in politics today and, you know, and have that conversation and try and get them involved too. I think I'll start with, with uh the care part. I think it's critical, and I'm so glad you raised the question about self-care, but also collective care, because I think, especially in movements from the past, for sure, as we're seeing now, um, emotions you know, dip and rise a lot, depending on what's, what tweets go out the night before, or <coughs> the news breaks uh, in the morning. And I think that you know, having a ritual, a routine of self-care daily, but also you know, being the buddy system, checking in on people you know who are greatly impacted by what's happening, and and, and really and being able to talk about process um, the harmful emotions, I think a lot of people, is helpful. Just being a, a sympathetic ear is critical. Just to let go of certain emotions. Um, I, I think another part, the other part of the question, um, I guess, you know, action or challenge I think we all can do, which I, I did yesterday, which I can share with you, is actually reach out and, and engage someone for coffee or lunch or a conversation who may not agree with what you, what you believe in or may not agree with your certain position. Um, I would love to see a panel, I don't know if it's possible, I would love to see a panel like this with the same thing happen in Arkansas, or in Kentucky, or one of the states that this president won. Like, that would be amazing, to have this type of discussion in one of those, in one of those communities. Um, yesterday, I was, I was going to my neighborhood coffee shop, and Darling Coffee, and there was an older white man in Inwood 
standing out in front of the coffee shop with a sign that said, Trump, make, make America great again. Now, I, I thought, like, wow, he's crazy. Like, he's going to get hurt out here, actually. <laughs> um, I, I was like, he's, I don't know. I, said, I, I don't know. I, I said, I'm worried about him. Um, but people were, like, walking by and glaring at him and saying things to him and intimidating him. And I, and I, I, I smiled and, you know, spoke to him. I said, I, I said thank you. I said, I, I don't agree with anything that that sign represents. And I didn't vote for that person, but I respect your right to stand out here and, and would. Um, I, I appreciate that. And so I went inside and I, I, I bought myself a tea. I, I bought a, I actually bought a hot, hot chocolate for him. And I took it back outside. I gave it to him. And he smiled. He shook my hand. And said thank you so much. Like I, I respect you. And I, it, we spoke. We spoke for like five minutes. And we agreed to meet this week or next to have a coffee together. Just to sit down and talk. I said I don't agree with that sign or what it represents, but I like to talk with you and just you know hear your perspective. Why are you holding that sign? And I'll tell you mine. Maybe we can. You know, just have a conversation. And I think those those one-on-one -on -one moments, we don't hold them up enough. But I think sometimes change can happen systemically, macro. Sometimes it happens micro, and that means kind of you know being vulnerable and going to outside our comfort zone to connect on that one-on-one -on -one level. And and I think um, that's something we all can easily do. I mean, many of us, I'm sure, in our families have people who didn't vote or don't think the thoughts we have here or around certain issues and. We don't cut them off, you know. So I just feel like, you know, we can all engage someone, one person or community that may not agree with us, but have a conversation. Ariane, you want to answer your own question a bit? Um, I wasn't even prepared for that. Um, <laughs> um, I mean, I would like to just sort of, you know, reiterate what everybody has said. I mean, I think we all have to find. It was like what Joe was saying is where you can kind of uniquely fit in and I think it is you know the one thing is becoming you know engaged and aware and informed I and mean, this is a positive because I feel like you know if I keep looking for the positives in this I just see people aware and um, that we didn't used to you know be keeping up with some of these issues or even interested in some of these issues so I'd like to think that's very fertile soil for something hugely transformative to happen um, and again you know seeing sort of I, I, I agree very much with what what Jimmy is saying I do think that the worst thing we could do is become further divided so I think trying to find you know where we have common ground and having empathy um, is going to be really important because I just think you know we have to you know to me the energy is less well what are we protesting against and more about what are we standing for um, so that's where I sort of tend to focus um, and then yeah the self-care thing I mean I'll be trying it out you know just the same way with all of you because to me I am you know because of my work I have to stay somewhat informed but it's a certain point you know what it's time to like turn off the phone turn off the computer <laughs> be with my family go outside in nature like this is our life mm -hmm. you know so we do have to find that balance and for each of us I think it's you know personal and, and custom Customize. But um, but mostly I think in having conversations like this, I like the idea of taking these type of conversations on the road, having more and more dialogue, because I think we're all still figuring out it's okay to not know where you know this is all going, but let's all like come together and maybe we can have something really, as I said, powerful and transformative come out of what feels like to me almost like a tipping point, turning point moment where we're all awake. And now I'm gonna hand it over to Michael to see what Michael would say for his answer. <laughs> Um, well, I, I was thinking about a couple of things that, that people were saying, and, and, and the, there, there are a few things that sort of spinning around for me. Um, one of them is, I, I work a lot, as you all know, um, I work a lot to engage men to support gender equality. And, and as an American, you know, I'm, a, I'm an American, so I'm in sales. I have to sell this, this idea that men should support gender equality. I cannot sell to men the total reconfiguration of masculinity. Yeah. It's a non-starter. You have to give men something in, to replace it with. You, the, I'm not just going to abandon everything I've ever known. So uh, my, my strategy is to, to suggest that men are already there in some ways. To suggest the question, as, as we were talking earlier, that you know, as, as you said, as, as Dan said earlier, uh, that men are stakeholders in this, in this, that these aren't necessarily women's issues, these are issues for all of us. That men are stakeholders in the conversation about parental leave, in the conversation about choice, in the conversation about violence, in the conversation about wage equality, all of these different areas. 
men are stakeholders in these as well. That's a, that's a conversation we can begin. Um, I also think that one of the things that I found most startling um, was after uh, the you know one of the many egregious things that Trump said on the campaign trail. Of course, I'm thinking of the Access Hollywood tape. Um, uh, which is only one of many. It happened to be, you know, the, the, the one of the more graphic. Um, but one of the things that struck me at that moment was how many Republicans who we didn't particularly support or like immediately came forward at that moment. Now we may have our problems with what they said. If you remember, Mitch McConnell, John McCain, both said, "I have daughters," right? I don't like that because I have daughters, and we all said. You should say that that's not right because it's not right. right. right? And we all said, I completely agree. But at that moment, they were inching toward the conversation. right? Because, er, because And there were, was a moment there, it seemed to me, that they saw themselves as, as all men, I believe, are. We are all genetically connected to women. Every man in this room already knows what it feels like to love a woman and want her to th thrive. Because we're not just men, we're husbands and partners and lovers and friends and sons and, and grandsons and fathers and grandfathers. And so we already know that. So in a way, what we're asking men to do is do publicly what they already think they're doing privately. To say it publicly. To talk our walk, so to speak, as opposed to walking our walk. And I think that's the place, and I agreed with, with, with Joelle, that this is a place that we're not so good at following. We really would rather hear the gender equality conversation go more like, thank you so much for bringing this to our attention. We'll take it from here. <laughs> the sort of the cavalry approach to gender equality. So following is a really good strategy, I think, for people to understand the stakeholders. And the last thing I want to say is one of my favorite political theorists, uh, Bernice Johnson Regan, <laughs> once said, um, once said, I think the most inspiring thing that I ever I, that I heard uh, her say once was that you don't build coalitions with people that you completely agree with. Mm -hmm. You build them with people you don't agree with, but you agree about this. And you say, and this is just to echo what Jimmy was saying, you you agree about this, and we're not going to forget that we don't agree about this and this and this and this. But on this, we agree. We can work together here. And I would be willing to bet that when you sit down with that Trump supporter, you'll find that one place where you agree. You can, and the point of though is you have to hold on to all the places you don't agree as well. It's not just a fake niceness where we agree. You are aware that you disagree on many issues, but on this one we agree. Let's work together on this. So that would be my, my, my one sort of ripple of hope here. I just want to thank all of our, you know, esteemed panelists for offering all of your wisdom and insight and, you know, ideas. Um, yes. Thank you so much. Um, I also want to rethank uh, Willa and Chris and RTM Limited um, for all that they did to make this event possible, um, which we are extremely grateful for. And thank all of you.